I'm Peter B. Collins. Welcome to my latest conversation here on Marin TV. I want to welcome back to our show Mary Beth Brangen and Jim Heddle, their co-directors of EON3, and that stands for the Ecological Options Network. You're based in Bolinas, and I want to thank you for coming back on the show today. In a recent uh, episode, Ray Lutz joined us. He's from San Diego and the Citizens Oversight Organization, and we covered a range of issues related to the shutdown of the San Onofre nuclear power plant in Southern California and the issue of nuclear waste, uh, the spent fuel that is uh, remaining on site there, and the Hobson's choices that we face in trying to deal with that. Now, you're currently in production on a documentary, a six-part series called Shutdown, the California-Fukushima Connection. And as we be begin our discussion, let's take a look. Authorities are desperately trying to cool down a reactor at the Fukushima number one plant. Frantic the attempts to prevent meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in Japan. Military helicopters spraying seawater onto damaged reactors as they battle to bring the emergency under control. I know that many Americans are also worried about the potential risks to the United States. We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. Fresh reports the from the EPA and others in this country show traces of radiation from that Japanese plant have migrated across the Pacific Ocean, have now reached a total of 14 states here that we know of, including Florida and New York. Within days, Fukushima fallout was detected on the North American West Coast, soon across the continent, and as far away as Eastern Europe. My partner Jim and I were horrified as we watched the unfolding disaster from our home in Northern California. I was devastated. This was exactly what we'd worked for decades to help to prevent. We realized that California's two operating nuclear plants at Diablo Canyon and San Onofre both sit in earthquake and tsunami zones, just like Fukushima Daiichi. We knew work was now needed to stop these potential Fukushimas from happening here in California, and we needed to find others doing that work. Powerful clip from the documentary series called Shutdown, the California Fukushima Connection. And Mary Beth, as you pardon me, as you narrated uh, your own reaction, uh, we first heard President Obama deliver the nuclear industry talking points that you don't have anything to worry about. It's all going to be fine. And this is a clip from a recent article in the New York Times mm -hmm. reporting. And in the headline, they even tell you, don't worry about this, that the levels of uh, background radiation found in California wines have increased. Mm -hmm. And so the corporate media delivers these uh, be calm and carry on type messages while they suppress the coverage of the ongoing crisis at Fukushima. And they're still, uh, you know, trying to cool that down and pumping uh, huge amounts of radioactive water into the sea on a daily basis. Right. And, and life goes on and, uh, you know, we're told not to worry about it. Right. But you choose to worry about it, and I thank you for that. Actually, we're part of a citizens um, group of, of um, all along the northwest coast who pay to get ocean water sampling, too. And it also like the wine, has had a doubling of the background radiation that was in the, uh, the ocean from the above ground testing mm -hmm. uh, 40, 50, 70 years ago. Yeah. And Jim, I recall that we have a system of air quality monitors up and down the West Coast. 
but that after Fukushima that many of the, uh, the, the systems were not operating and that we couldn't get clear data. Has that been cleaned up? Well, no. Uh, actually, they were turned off after the first uh, indications of pollution of milk and produce and food. Mm -hmm. uh, and a citizen's network of monitoring was set up up and down the coast and across the country and also in Japan mm -hmm. to produce independently uh, ascertained evidence that, mm -hmm. of what was really going on. Yeah. Um. And I, I want to recommend for our viewers, there's a book that was just published this year about the Chernobyl uh, disaster. And it's a fascinating account written by a Harvard professor who was born in Ukraine and was there uh, at the time of the, uh, the accident at Chernobyl. And he gives just a brilliant, uh, not blow by blow, but minute by minute account uh, of how that happened. And I, I just want to recommend that for people who want to want to dig in. The books haven't been written yet, for the most part, about Fukushima, and yet we see uh, the nuclear industry largely unfazed, and even the academic community seems to be fairly quiet. Is that because there's nothing to be concerned about and you're just uh, crazy alarmists? Hmm. Well, we've been documenting uh, nuclear issues for, <clears throat> I guess, about uh, four decades. We started by producing a film for PBS called uh, Strategic. Strategic Trust, the Making of Nuclear Free Palau, which got us in a lot of trouble with the State Department and the Defense Department. We were pilloried as... Uh, uh, disaffected ideologues, mm -hmm. and uh, letters were written to funding agencies uh, telling them that we were not to be funded because we were producing anti-American propaganda with CBS funds, I mm -hmm. mean PBS funds. Mm -hmm. But we've recovered from that uh, pillaring, and we went on to produce a, a film with David L. Brown uh, called uh, Free Zone, Democracy meets the nuclear threat, and now we're producing this uh, this documentary series to bring people up to date on what's really going on mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the nuclear contamination of our biosphere. Mm -hmm. And California is really uh, on the front line in several ways. Uh, it's on the receiving end of the fallout from Fukushima, which continues, as you say, to, to this day. And also it's on the front line of dealing with uh, the cascade of shutdowns that's going on across the country of nuclear plants. Uh, there are two uh, in the two last remaining nuclear plants at San Onofre, uh, just between L.A. and, and San Diego, mm -hmm. and uh, Diablo Canyon, which is north of uh, um, San Luis. San Luis Obispo. Well, it's 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 north of, uh, yeah, it's right in that area, and all of them, both of them, are in danger. Huge uh, enclaves of population centers. Mm -hmm. And there are four reactors: two at Diablo and two at San Onofre. San Onofre mm -hmm. was closed down um, in 2013, and uh, Diablo Canyon is slated to be closed down at least by 2024, mm -hmm. although people are pushing to have it closed sooner. Mm -hmm. But California is now dealing with uh, what do we do with the waste that remains mm -hmm. from all these years of production. Well, and, and I, I don't want to focus too much <clears throat> on the economics, but you know, we're told that we have this great capitalist system and that market forces, you know, take care of things. But by failing to ascribe the costs end to end for nuclear power, and what I mean by that is accounting for the cost of decommissioning these plants when their lifespan mm -hmm. expires and dealing with the nuclear waste, we've created a false picture. And even with that, they haven't been able to build a plant on budget the cost overruns are jammed onto the ratepayers, and we're told to sit down and shut up. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it's a colossal failure on a business, a scientific, and a public health level. 
Mm -hmm. And y y there are now some people who claim, well, this is the silver bullet for climate change because mm -hmm. there's no smokestack. Well, <laughs> respond to that, please, Jim. Yeah, well, um, the, the amount of nuclear waste that's built up from plants all over this country and all over the world is humongous. There are tons and tons they call it metric tons, but a metric ton is actually over 2,000 pounds, so it's somewhat deceptive. Mm -hmm. But this is a clear example of the non-enforcement of so-called free market capitalism, because if the costs of nuclear power, the externalized costs, mm -hmm. uh, were factored into the equation, it would clearly fail, and it is failing. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a recent study by uh, the American Academy of Science that was conducted by pro-nuclear people who believe that it's a cure for climate change concluded that the future of nuclear power is grim. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, small nuclear reactors that everybody, Bill Gates and others are investing in, not going to happen because as Amory Lovin said decades ago, the nuclear industry is dying from an overdose of market forces. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we've also failed to invest in infrastructure to deal with this. And we have ongoing problems at the Hanford uh, uh, mm -hmm. facility in Washington State. Mm -hmm. uh, those who are trying to clean up the contamination have been recently uh, exposed. And uh, we don't have the facilities to transfer this nuclear waste. And Mary Beth, I know that's one of the issues you've been focused on, is the idea that we could take the waste from San Onofre, and, and let's just dream that there is a perfect space in the United States somewhere where we could store this without you know, risk to populations. And we don't have a way to get it there. Right, that is, it's so risky to move this at all that the transportation risks are, are over the top. The, um, the vehicles that are required to um, shield the, um, the containers to somewhat reduce the, the radiation are so heavy that they would endanger bridges, highways, um, they're, they're considering putting it on barges where they can, like from Humboldt Bay, they would have to barge it down probably. They couldn't go around the um, curvy mountain roads up there mm -hmm. uh, to get it to Highway 5, for instance, or, or even 101 mm -hmm. um, with these 100 axle vehicles. It's just impossible. Um, plus, they are risking all the population in between points, from point to point. You're, if um, you would have a, an accident, like has recently happened with uh, trains in Iowa, uh, it would be a horrible, horrible tragedy mm -hmm. because uh, the radioactivity can't be contained and it right. could be um, uh, contaminating large bodies of water even more than they already are contaminated. And there's 12,000 per year accidents on trains, 12,000 train accidents per year mm -hmm. uh, without uh, considering the nuclear waste uh, problem on that, those train tracks that are failing for so many reasons. So this is um, this is part, of the, and they say, well, the Navy has transported their their mm -hmm. waste safely. Well, how would we know? We <laughs> they they aren't going to tell us if they had a problem, and they are putting maybe half the amount of waste into one container that the um, proposed commercial shipments mm -hmm. would have. Mm -hmm. Now, in our previous show, we talked about this effort to site a, a nuclear dump in Hobbs, New Mexico. And Jim, could you update us a little bit on the politics of trying to find a nuclear waste site? And if you think that our elected leaders uh, are really fully evaluating the risks that are attendant. Well, the federal government promised decades ago to take possession and 
responsibility for the nuclear waste and put it in a centralized geological repository. Mm -hmm. After decades of searching and trying and expenditure of billions of dollars, that hasn't been done. They've found no place. The Obama administration closed the Yucca Mountain facility mm -hmm. uh, because it is unsuitable for such long-term storage. Mm -hmm. This stuff lasts longer than civilization has yet existed, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that it prom the federal government promised to take the waste and hasn't has led to a buildup of waste at all the reactor sites around the country. <clears throat> and utilities are beginning to sue the United States federal government for not living up to its obligations. Mm -hmm. And so taxpayers are now on the hook for billions of dollars of uh, bailout money, essentially, for the nuclear industry. And so a so-called Simpkis bill, it's, um, it's a bill that was uh, named after Illinois Senator, a uh, Republican, not Senator, but a, a Congressman, mm -hmm. um, John Simkus, is, has moved out of the House now, having been approved, and is in the Senate. We learned yesterday that, uh, and it, it, its its purpose is to resuscitate the Yucca Mountain oh. failed repository, mm -hmm. and also to establish a network of so-called consolidated interim storage sites around the country mm -hmm. that would temporarily, how this temporarily in big quotes, house uh, the stranded waste, so-called, from mm -hmm. the nuclear reactors around the country. Um, we just learned yesterday, however, that uh, the funding portion of uh, the Simcus bill and, and other uh, attempts to uh, fund the rebooting of Yucca has not been approved. Mm -hmm. So it's basically it's illegal. Uh, given the current law structure to set up such a centralized or mm -hmm. consolidated interim storage network. And so they're pushing it even though they're going to have to change the laws to make it happen. And Senator Feinstein supports the Shimkus bill? Is that she, what I understand? She actually, does. Actually, Senator Feinstein has been a major force in um, trying to get this whole, whole thing started, this idea of temporary storage, um, which means that you would be moving thousands and thousands of th these shipments twice, mm -hmm. once to a, 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 an interim storage and then again, hopefully, to something that would be permanent. Well, based on the half-life of this stuff, an interim facility would be for, what, 100,000 years? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And they want to use containers that are only um, supposed to last a couple of centuries, I mean, a couple, mm -hmm. <laughs> like 20 years. Oh, boy. I know. It's mm. just insane. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to go back to the yucca point because it's very important that people understand because you, the media always says, oh, it was a failed project because of political considerations. But, uh, and it's true that Nevada does not want it. However, it was also technically a failure. Mm -hmm. It's in a volcano um, uh, area. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. was uh, created by a, a volcano. And doesn't it risk the groundwater for Las Vegas? Groundwater for and the um, uh, Shoshone, Western Shoshone as well. Mm -hmm. And it's their land, actually, mm -hmm. under the Treaty of Ruby Valley. Mm -hmm. So it's really... 14 ways to Sunday, a bad mm -hmm. idea. And Nevada doesn't have any nuclear plants, although it's been the site of nuclear tests. It's, mm -hmm. it's the site of, at uh, Yucca Mountain is just down the road from the national um, test site. Test mm -hmm. site. Yeah, just so, like New Mexico. So well, I, I want to shift to another topic, but before we do, uh, when and where can people see your series, Shut Down the California-Fukushima Connection? Well, we've finished the first two episodes, and we're working on the third, which will tell the story of San Onofre and this waste conundrum that mm -hmm. is a microcosm of the country's problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're hoping to have it out by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Great. But, uh, we'll keep people, us posted on that. Okay. Go ahead. Mary people Beth. can go to our website to check on 
um, the progress. Eon3.org. Okay, eon3.org. Now, I'm holding in my hand here a statement that was signed by 230 scientists from 41 countries expressing serious concerns regarding the ubiquitous and increasing exposure to electromagnetic forces uh, generated by electric and wireless devices. Uh, and this is before the rollout of what's called 5G. Now we have a little clip here, which is an industry promotional piece for 5G. Uh, let's watch this now. 5G will be the foundation for virtual reality, autonomous driving, the Internet of Things, and stuff we can't even yet imagine. But what exactly is a 5G network? The truth is, experts can't tell us what 5G actually is, because they don't even know yet. So, wait a minute. The experts don't know what 5G is? Jim, help me out here. But we're rolling it out anyway. 5G is a new uh, level of cellular technology it's development. It's the fifth generation after mm -hmm. four previous generations of... And from what I understand, it requires... Uh, it, it operates at lower levels, so it requires more cell towers or antennas. Is that right? Well, it's shorter wavelength. Uh -huh. It's millimeter wavelength. And so it um, requires line of sight. Mm -hmm. And uh, But they want to do it um, every 200 feet. They want to put these antennas along the public rights of way mm -hmm. and uh, on what they call vertical infrastructure, vertical street furniture. I never heard so of that So light before. posts and light utility poles? Light posts and... Uh, Utility poles, exactly. Mm -hmm. And people have described this as a junkyard on a pole. <laughs> <laughs> it's really ugly. And uh, they call them in the, their promo small cells, but they actually have about the capacity of uh, one third of a large macro cell. And they are going to be every 200 feet. Wow. And then only 30 feet from your bedroom window, possibly. I mean, this is a real, real problem. And I'm sure it's all been thoroughly tested in the labs, and uh, they've been able to show that the radiation doesn't have any risk to humans, right? right? Yeah, like all technology, it's rolled out, and we do the testing later. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I have a report that uh, I got the other day based on a, a study in Europe. Uh, cell phone use in children and teens translates to five times greater increase in brain cancer. Now, uh, I can't speak to the scientific accuracy of this report, but I do believe that Europe is far ahead of the United States in objective research about the impact of cell phones on humans. And we're in a deep denial uh, driven by the interests of the uh, wireless industry. And Mary Beth, do you see any parallels to uh, previous forms of public denial about risk to human health? Absolutely. This is, um, uh, they have actually admitted themselves that they war-gamed the science. That's their term. Uh, that was just recently in a Nation magazine article by Mark Dowie and Mark Hertzgard. Mm -hmm. And th they have um, just created doubt. That's the playbook that um, tobacco used, big tobacco. They knew the science was um, clear, and so do the cell phone companies. However, they know also that they can just uh, continue, if they can just continue the doubt, then they can continue selling uh, things like that. And actually, just recently in France, a study was done on the cell phones, um, whether and if they were used, if they were studied the way they are used, which is against the ear, in, hold, held in the pocket mm -hmm. or in the bra, mm -hmm. these are um, then you would be over the guidelines of exposure limits. Mm -hmm. But the the industry has hidden that. In, and it does have a disclaimer in the bowels of your cell phone or in the manual uh, of the cell phone when you mm -hmm. buy it. But they, it, you know, it's, it's 
four-point font, and mm -hmm. you would never find it. Yeah. So we have to um, thank Dr. Joel Moskovich f f uh, for actually filing a lawsuit against the um, uh, Depart California Department of Health, who had sat on uh, a warning, a cell phone warning, a pub flyer that they should have issued to the uh, public seven years ago, hmm. and finally it's coming out. There's a right to know ordinance that was um, passed by Berkeley yeah. uh, about this very thing, mm -hmm. and then um, it's continued to be fought against by the uh, wireless industry. Mm -hmm. So they're definitely trying to, to keep the truth about the science out of the public's awareness, but mm -hmm. the science keeps piling up. Jim, we have just a couple of minutes remaining. Can you tick off for us what you see as the uh, most serious risks from cell phones in general and 5G as it uh, is presumably rolled out? Well, this kind of radiation destroys DNA. That's the, ba the baseline of it. But it also has all kinds of uh, risks besides cancer and immune system uh, malfunction and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, that make it extremely dangerous to the future of humankind and other life forms as well. Mm -hmm. Neu I, yeah. Go ahead. Neurological damage, and um, there's just been recently the uh, National Toxicology Project's um, result of a rare, um, showing rare cancers of the heart and of the brain. And then people say, well, that's even though this is a gold standard for. The, um, animal studies in the U.S. has to be replicated and just a couple of weeks after that came out, uh, the Institute um, of uh, the Ramazzini Institute in Italy had another uh, study that showed the same cancers coming from cell phone or cell tower exposure, which is even lower mm -hmm. than the cell phone exposures. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for the work that you do, and thank you for returning to the show to talk more with us today. I want to recommend that people visit your website at eon3.org to keep up to date. There's a lot of great information there. And as you progress with the documentary, uh, when it's all finished, why don't you come back and we'll talk about it some more. Thanks, Thanks. very much, Peter. Jim Heddle, Mary Beth Brangen, thank you for joining me today in conversation here on Marin TV.